كده بدات اسجل يا دكتور ياسر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Welcome everyone. Uh, good evening. It's nice to meet you again uh, in this uh, weekly meeting of the ESMT. Uh, today we have uh, hemodialysis chapter headed by Professor Hisham Al Sayed, uh, and our uh, lecture will be given by Professor Magdi Sharaf. This session will be moderated by Professor Hisham Al Sayed, who is well known. He is the professor of Uh, internal medicine and nephrology in Shams University. He is the vice president of ESNT, hemodialysis chapter chair, and also the head of uh, hemodialysis Afran committee. Now we can proceed with Professor Hisham, who will introduce Professor Magdi and start with the lecture. Please, Professor Hisham. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Yasser Abdel Hamid. It's my pleasure to be here with my colleagues and professors. Today, I think it's one of the outstanding talk. We have a very eminent speaker today, well-known figure, Professor Dr. Magdi Sharawi. Professor Magdi is a professor of nephrology in Shams University. He is the head of the transplantation department of Shams University Specialized Hospital. He is also a very uh, uh, well experienced, more than 30 years in the uh, field of nephrology, including the dialysis prescription. Professor Dr. Magdi is also a member of the Afran Hemodialysis Committee, and we are waiting for, uh, to hear from him a lot of the uh, updates in the hemodialysis. I think that today the session of the uh, talk of hemodialysis prescription is one of the uh, uh, fruitful ones that uh, convey all what we need as a junior, as well as the seniors, to know how to prescribe the hemodialysis doses. And subsequently, later on, we will go to more individualizations of the hemodialysis. As I also uh, know and tell my colleagues always, there is no one size fit for all. So we have today a global view for uh, the hemodialysis prescription. And I think we have to uh, make some questions and we have to be answered from the board. Please, Professor Dr. Magdi, uh, go ahead. We are all listening. Thank you very much, Professor Sham Said, uh, Professor Yasser, and Professor Yasser Abdul Hamid, uh, Dr. Karim, for this uh, introduction. Uh, special thanks to my uh, uh, brother, Professor Sham Said, uh, as I mentioned before, is an eminent uh, nephrologist uh, in Egypt, one of, uh, of those who made uh, hemodialysis. Uh, uh, past, present, and future, not only in Egypt, but now uh, internationally and... Uh, okay. So today I'm going... Please, please, please mute all, Yakari. Please mute all. Okay, I, I won't keep you uh, long. I'm going today... Unmute. Okay. Today, uh, uh, my topic is multidisciplinary approach to optimize hemodialysis outcome. And we know that hemodialysis is a, a dilemma. It started in the 60s and 70s, the regular hemodialysis. And from that time, we need to know what are hemodialysis outcomes? What are expected of this hemodialysis? At what, can, what can be done to improve the outcome? And how do we measure this outcome and how to deliver uh, uh, the proper dialysis to achieve this outcome? And finally, one of the important issues I will discuss today, how these measures are perceived by our patients and is, is there any cost benefit of improving outcome or not? This is a concept of my presentation today. And I'll start by saying that hemodialysis outcomes is regarding survival of the patient hospitalization and rehospitalization of the patient, which will affect his quality of life and then his out-of-pocket uh, uh, expenditure and of the uh, 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 country income. So let us say in 2021, in this year, do you think that we achieved hemodial good hemodialysis outcome in our patients? Even, not even in Egypt, but worldwide, 
I will let you answer this question if you want in the chat box. Uh, 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 let me see how much, how many of you think that we have achieved hemodialysis outcomes. And then at the end, I will ask this question again. So what about survival? We know that all cause mortality in hemodialysis patient is by far much more, more than 100% higher than in non-CKD patients. And if we see how the else's mod uh, uh, renal replacement modality affect mortality, we'll find that the overall mortality is high, but there are great difference between patient on transplantation mortality is almost one fourth of those on dialysis, either hemo or proteinal dialysis. And again, all cause hospitalization is also more in patients with chronic kidney disease than in those without chronic kidney disease. And if we discuss, if we separate it into end stage kidney disease without dialysis, hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, the mortality as an adjusted hospitalization is far higher in those on hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis than those on. Uh, transplantation. That's why we should know that transplantation is the best option for the patients. And what about the adjusted cause specific hospitalization? Again, the most common cause of hospitalization is infection and cardiovascular disease. Those are the major complication and this affects the patient's survival and the quality of life. And the modality of transplant of, of dialysis also it's 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 worse in, 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 in patient. Uh, 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 on the else's then in patient receiving transplantation. And if we compare modality, uh, we'll find that peritoneal dialysis is much better than hemodialysis as regard all cause uh, uh, mortality and hospitalization. And still, there is a lot of uh, uh, the need of the patient to get to the nephrologist, to the primary care provider in areas where there is primary care provider or both, or, or uh, 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 in diabetic patient in CKD with diabetes, with hypertension and all diseases. So patients are not yet achieving the good survival, not even close to their peers in, 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 in transplantation rather than in normal population. And again, all cause hospitalization again, is still high rehospitalization, which is a bad thing for the patient, and the mortality in those who are rehospitalized are by far much higher than those without rehospitalization. What about expenditure? It is increasing worldwide. We know in Egypt how the prices is. We know the cost of the else is the cost of, of the uh, of, uh, uh, hemodialyzer, of water purification system, of transportation, and it is getting higher and higher year after year. and it, it, this is uh, uh, the United States uh, cost. It's increasing worldwide. And the cost of the comorbidity, infection, cardiovascular comorbidity is also increasing. You know, the cost of, of stents, the cost of, uh, uh, cost of uh, uh, revascularization is increasing. And this is how cost is uh, uh, individualized. We know in, in, in the hemodialysis patient, this is not in Egypt, of course. The outpatient care, which include the fees for physician and nurses represent the higher cost in those in hemodialysis. That's why in the Western country, they are now shifting the patient into home dialysis to spare this great amount of, of money. And that's why transplantation is less costly even than peritoneal dialysis because peritoneal dialysis, the cost of fluid, even in the United States is still high and it's not that far from hemodialysis nowadays. And, they, and uh, that's why in, in, in this is in Canadian program, shifting patient to home dialysis will save a lot of money. Uh, maybe personal dialysis and home hemodialysis, uh, uh, there is comparable annual uh, uh, maintenance expenses between these two modality of dialysis, but the training cost is less with personal dialysis than in hemodialysis because there is a machine and so on. So let us get to how to optimize the else's prescription to achieve this outcome. There is a lot of facets. There is a lot of areas that we can improve the else's to improve outcome. And this include anemia management, fluid electrolyte homeostasis, adequate solute removal, vascular access, good nutrition, blood pressure control, 
CKD, MBD management, among many others. But let me just today summarize some of these factors because they are feasible, they can be corrected in our unit. Let me start with the health dose. It started in the 80s when in the United States they have regular dialysis since the 1970. So they tested a theory, patient on high KTV with long dialysis, what are the survival versus patient with low KTV and short dialysis session. And it was clear that patient who have higher KTV with long dialysis hours, 4.5 to 5 hours, have great difference in survival over just one year between those with low KTV and short dialysis. And long dialysis session with good dialyzer was the best option at the time. And from that time, the concept of dialysis dose, which represent at the time solute removal, the KTV, we know that the KTV, it started by Frank Gotch and John uh, Sergent in, in 1985, and then the rare, rare reduction ratio by uh, uh, Laurie and Lowe in 1991, these are two measures of solute removal that was used to measure dialysis dose. And they are still in use up till now and still in the guideline. Although if, if you go to the internet, you'll find the KTV Dogger Dash Dialysis Dose Finder, which you can easily calculate the KTV for your patient by just measuring the post dialysis weight, the ultrafiltration volume, the pre dialysis BUN and, and post dialysis BUN, and it will get you to KTV immediately. So we'll do, you, you, you will know what's the KTV of your patient. But this KTV was critical, criticized uh, uh, much by many authors. Why? Because it is only a measure of solute removal of small solutes, urea. Uh, 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 and this is not the en enough measure for uh, adequacy of dialysis uh, because urea reflects poorly the removal of lower weight range molecule. And it does not represent the higher molecular weight molecule like the beta-2 microglobulin or, or parathyroid hormone or uh, 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 amylene. So it, it's not a measure of the complete process of the else. It's only for solute removal. Even it does not reflect serum phosphorus uh, uh, kinetic. And also it is poor measure of control of extra fluid volume. And one of the, of the worst uh, outcome, outcome of KTV is that it underestimates the hemodialysis dose in women and small men. And this is clear from this study showing that patient with body weight less than 50 require higher KTV uh, uh, up to 1.6, 1.7. And females require higher KTV goals than male to achieve survival, the same survival. And this is what we are not practicing in our dialysis unit. We usually give the larger dialyzer and the higher pump speed and the longer duration for the obese patient. While those who are underweight, and this is clear from this study published in 2019, that the lower the weight, the higher the KTV you should target. Because survival in this patient is worse if you have KTV 1.2 or 1.3, like the guideline. And although this KTV was criticized, John de Gerdes, have published a new, uh, 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 not I don't say guideline, but a new concept, which he modified KTV, KTV according to surface area, and nowadays according to metabolic rate. And he says it remains a useful measure of hemodialysis dose. And he said that removal of small molecular weight solutes shows a strong relationship to hemodialysis outcome, especially in survival. So we, we are still using it. And this is another new publication of using the surface area normalized standard KTV, which measure KTV not to the weight of the patient, but to his surface area to avoid the size difference. And it showed that uh, 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 this surface area normalized KTV is better parameter in defining hemodialysis dosing, which can be calculated by available online tool. You can calculate surface area easily. And it showed significant correlation with survival. So there is still interest in, in KTV. We cannot ignore it at all. And that's why it's still in the Kiruki guideline, in the Kirigo guideline, we still use a target single pool KTV of 1.4 per hemodialysis session with a minimum delivered of 1.2. And this is class 1B, which is good evidence. So we're still using KTV in spite 
that we know it does not represent the whole process of uh, uh, good dialysis because it shows significant relation with mortality. So we still in use for it. And I will discuss this later on with my professor and uh, uh, Professor Sham Said, of course, of course will uh, uh, illuminate us more about this item. What about fluid and electrolyte hemostasis? This is the second item our patient is asking us. How many times, uh, uh, what are the filters, the, the, the hemodialyzer size, hemodialyzer, hemodialyzer type, hemodialysis type, and then about the weight and the fluid and electrolyte hemostasis. We know that our patients are fluctuating between hypovolemia, especially during dialysis, especially with rapid ultrafiltration rate, with excessive ultrafiltration rate, patients become hemodynamic instable, they, they develop end organ ischemia and mortality. And then in between dialysis, they have high hypervolemia with overly slow ultrafiltration rate, especially if they are anuric, they develop hypertension, ventricular hypertrophy, heart failure, arrhythmia, and mortality. And during the hemodialysis phase, which is only 12 hours per week, patient may develop acute hemodynamic stress due to this uh, uh, rapid volume depletion and electrolyte imbalance, especially with potassium and arrhythmia and rebound after dialysis. And then the rest of the week, they, they are at chronic hemodynamic stress by fluid overload, hypervolemia, hypertension, high congestive injury, and cardiac remodeling. And this is continuous process. And we know that fluid overload is associated with hypertension, with left ventricular hypertrophy, arteriosclerosis, uh, uh, pulmonary edema, congestion, inflammation, uh, morbidity, cost of re-hospitalization, anemia, and strokes. And the fluid depletion is also associated with uh, 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 brain per permanent, uh, uh, permanent uh, brain damage, hypotension, generalized malaise weakness, ischemia, peripheral ischemia, gut ischemia with escape of uh, uh, inflammatory marker and the microbiota into the circulation, liver ischemia, inflammation, and morbidity. So we have to have a balance and we have, according to many studies, the, the highest ultrafiltration rate should not exceed 10 to 13 milliliter per hour per kg. So for an average patient who is 70 kilograms, the maximum ultrafiltration during four hours is 2.8 kilogram. This is the maximum if he is 60, uh, uh, 70 uh, kilogram of weight. This is uh, 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 the best relation between ultrafiltration and survival. After this, after uh, uh, 10, to 13, there is a high mortality rate in those patients. And the patient also will suffer, of, suffer from longer recovery time. And the target weight prescription is related to a, a, a hospitalization and readmission. This is a study showing the target weight adjustment within seven days of hospital discharge. Most patients increased hospitalization if they develop higher weight between the else's sessions. So we need to adjust patient fluid intake and the fluid ultrafiltration, and this by targeting sodium, not by targeting fluid. You cannot advise your patient not to drink water, but you can advise him clearly not to take sodium, because sodium is the main driver for thirst, and this is the main driver for, for volume overload and the fluid overload. That's why in this very nice publication, it's, it proposed that we have to uh, target volume first approach, which means that you have to, to, to adjust the else's according to patient volume. And this is again proposed by Jean de Gerdes in to, 2015, what he called minimum hemodialysis time. He will prescribe the time for the patient according to his weight. So if it's a 70 kilogram patient, we, we measure intraatic weight gain and we will put the maximum ultrafiltration rate allowed to prevent complication. This is the weight of the patient and we will get the time. So not all the patient will get four hours. Some of them will need five hours or more to get rid of the increased intradialytic weight gain. And this is a very logic protocol or strategy to achieve good dialysis outcome and to prevent morbidity as well as mortality. If we see, how many patients, this is uh, uh, the US DOPS uh, published in May 2021. 
showing that almost 60% of their patients are now achieving this goal between 10 and 12.9 milli per kg per hour, but there is 40% of patients not yet achieving this goal. So this is another way to improve outcome. Then we come to the third, one of the most important items is anemia management. Of course, we all know, we are all nephrologists, we are work in the ELSIS unit, we know the deuterious effect of anemia, not just on, 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 on hemoglobin, but in the nervous system, in the heart, in the lung, in the generalized fatigue, in the mitochondria, and also in rapid loss of residual kidney function, as well as in the cognitive function of the brain. So we need to treat anemia, and we need to target hemoglobin between 10 and 12. And this was associated with the best survival. This is the European Best Practice Guideline in uh, uh, 20, 2009, showing this is the best hemoglobin if we, if we want to decrease morbidity and mortality. Again, left ventricular hypertrophy is best reduced with hemoglobin between 11.5 and 13. And that's why we should treat anemia in every patient. How to treat anemia? You have first to save blood of the patients. You have to ensure the health is adequacy. You have to correct inflammation and prevent malnutrition. How to save blood? We know that patients usually lose up to 800 milligram from the hemodialyzer from the filter itself every year, almost one liter every year, and almost another liter from GI bleeding, from heparin we are giving the patient, from non-steroidal, from aspirin, from anticoagulant. And then up to two liters from repeated tests and lab tests that we are doing every uh, 15 or every one month. We are doing a lot of unneeded lab tests for our patient. This may lead to anemia. So first step, please stop blood loss. You have to use proper hemodialyzer the, the hemodialysis that, that will not uh, uh, coagulate every session with good surface area, with good manufacture, to, to stop this. You have to stop non in our patient. And this is a very bad thing. Uh, uh, all of us, including me, we know that in every prescription for patient in hemodialysis, he is taking non anti-inflammatory medication that will cause dialysis and we have to decrease the lab work significantly. Also, we, we need to, to uh, uh, do a very good dialysis because this will improve not only anemia, but it will uh, lead to less epidose if you have a higher KTV. So again, back to KTV, this is another indication that we follow. Treating anemia is easy. We have a standard uh, uh, care and we have future therapies that will be available in Egypt soon. So standard therapy, we, we all prescribe erythropoiesis stimulating agents, the EPO. Iron supplement, which should be uh, prescribed intravenously. And additives, which are usually useless unless there is deficiency in this patient. This is a standard treatment that we have approached. And this is the, uh, the Kiriko guideline. It tells us clearly diagnose and evaluate anemia because we have patients with adenocarcinomas. We have patients with peptic ulcers. It's not just CKD. So we have to diagnose and evaluate. And then we have to correct iron first, and then use the proper dose of ESA to correct anemia. And finally, still in the guideline, we can transfuse our patient if they have acute anemia, rapid loss of blood to compensate for anemia. A, 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 a very important issue is IV iron. IV iron is, will lead to marvelous rise of uh, hemoglobin rather than oral iron or other iron. And we have some novel treatment. Soon in Egypt, we will have a hypoxia-inducible factor inhibitor. It will be available. This is an oral medication. It's not injectable, which good effect equivalent, maybe better than uh, erythropoietin with less side effect like hypertension. And there are outside dialyzate iron, and they have another form of phosphate clating agent. Uh, with dialysate iron. And we have other medication to treat anemia. And we have to target not just anemia uh, uh, treatment, but the cost effectiveness. Hemoglobin concentration should be customized. Young patient might have hemoglobin 13. Old patient, 10 is enough. 
we have to correct it partially if we cannot correct it completely. So if the patient cannot afford a full uh, EPO, you can use partial EPO correction. Don't leave him with seven hemoglobin, get him to nine hemoglobin, it's much better. Uh, we have to have very narrow target of, of uh, uh, hemoglobin. We have to follow up our patient. And this is the European Best Practice Guideline, very nice table showing the uh, best hemoglobin is between 10 and 12, TSAT 30 to 40, and 13, best less than 500, but don't stop iron even when it is 800. And above that, you have to uh, uh, ask yourself why there is high ferritin, and then you may give iron in some cases. Anemia treatment is related significantly to hemodialysis outcome and hemodialysis prescription, as I will mention in the, in the last uh, sector. Uh, uh, patient, hemodialysis patient profile should be studied carefully, his age, his uh, comorbid condition. You have to use anti-anemic drug properly. You have to change your practice pile uh, better. You have to, to ensure a very good hemodialysis efficiency, good nutrition, you have to avoid inflammation, use a very good vascular axis, and save blood. And this will lead to anemia correction. Another very important issue in, in, in managing hemodialysis patient is the nutritional agent. Good nutrition is very important for our patient, and it is usually uh, practiced by patient to patient, nurse to patient, and not on scientific basis, unfortunately. And we all know that albumin, less than 3.6, has a higher incidence of mortality. And most dialysis patients are usually less than 3.5. So we have to correct anemia to four or more, because the reference for survival is four. It is not 3.8 even. Uh, uh, arm circumference is a very good measure. We can just, you can feel your patient arm Patient with small arm circumference will have increased mortality and it reflects clearly a poor nutritional status. We all acquainted with the paradox of obesity. Obese patient on dialysis survive best than a lean patient or a thin patient. This is because these this obese patients are just eating well. Obesity is not good, but it reflects a good nutritional status. So they survive. So nutrition is very important. In 2020, the clinical practice guideline for treatment of, uh, for, uh, from renal association is produced and it, it uh, has a very clear guideline for CKD patient, dialysis or not dialysis. We have first to assess nutritional status on admission and then weekly for inpatient. And we have to review every two to three months and we have uh, 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 to use the recommended dialysis dose according to guideline. Again, again, they are using URR and KTV. And you have to correct metabolic acidosis with proper dialysis. What about uh, protein allowance for our patient? This is a very uh, uh, debatable issues between patients themselves. They tell each other not to eat protein. And I know some physician in some centers are again advising their patient not to eat protein. This is a clear guideline. In patient on hemodialysis, the daily allowance would be between 1.1 to 1.4 gram per kg of protein. Half of it, at least half of it, of high biological value of animal protein. This will allow very good nutrition for our patient and to maintain his uh, uh, anabolic status. Uh, 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 what about energy? This is again a very important issue. He should he should take 30 to 40 kilocalorie per kg, per kg of ideal body weight per day for all patients, of course, tailored to age and physical activity. I will not say a lot about CKD MBD because this is a very complex issue and it needs a, a special consideration and it needs playing or a, a, I, I call it juggling by the medication that we are, we are using to correct calcium, phosphorus, and PTH. We are using uh, 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 active vitamin D, which will correct hyper, hypocalcemia, which will suppress the PTH, but it may cause hyperphosphatemia. It may lead to a low dynamic bone disease. 
and we are using phosphate binder. Most of them in Egypt have calcium. They may lead to cal vascular calcification, higher calcium in the patient. So we have to tailor treatment. And this is very uh, 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 wise advice. You have to sit with the patient to re revise his medication and his feeding uh, issue. If we show that the, the, the best dialysis facility, which is Tassan up to a few years ago, only 40% of their patients are achieving proper phosphorus with calcium and calcium phosphorus product and PTH. We can achieve, we can achieve individual targets, but most of us cannot achieve the four targets, even in the best prolonged dialysis. This is a DOPS uh, uh, outcome, only 6% achieving the all target. And this is from uh, uh, Switzerland's Ron Alps, only 11%. It is difficult issue. So it needs a, a proper tackling that we will do it later on. We know that it is not just calcium and phosphorus and calcium sensing receptor or vitamin D receptor on the PTH, but now we have many other player, the FGF23, uh, uh, the clotho, uh, 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 the phosphate binder, the nutritional status, it is they all linked together. And as I mentioned, this will need another presentation by itself. Blood pressure control, again, is very important and it's usually neglected in our patient. The curve of incidence of hypertension, usually uh, at the start of the health is almost 70% of our patients are hypertensive. They reach 80% with years and then patients may become hypotensive later on. And the survival curve is a U-shaped curve. Those with uh, systolic blood pressure above, above 180 have increased mortality. And those with blood pressure less than 110 have decreased, have also increased mortality. So we have to keep the patient between 120 and 180 uh, 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 systolic. Astonishingly, uh, uh, if we control blood pressure, survival and cardiovascular uh, insult are less. And one of the most important advice to our patients and our nurses and our colleagues that blood pressure is usually due to volume overload. So don't start antihypertensive medication unless you get to the dry weight of the patient because almost 80% of dialytic hypertension or intradialytic hypertension is associated with increased dry weight. So we have to get rid of the dry weight, the excess weight to reach the proper dry weight and then treat hypertension. What are the guidelines? There is no clear guidelines for blood pressure, but the best guideline was published in Kiduki 2005, pre-dialysis 140 90, post-dialysis 130 80. This is uh, the best practice and uh, uh, up till now there is no clear guideline what is the best blood pressure for our patients. So getting to how to prescribe hemodialysis to deliver uh, uh, the proper hemoglobin, the proper KTV, the proper CKD, MPD target, uh, uh, the proper ultrafiltration. We have to sit and write prescription to our patient and to follow this prescription to get to our target. So we have to know what are the technical requirements to deliver this target. We need dialysis fluid, we need a good vascular access, we need a good machine, good dialyzer, we need to estimate those of the else's and then to, we ask out ourselves, should we put our patient in hemodialysis or other uh, form of the else's like HDF? Water treatment is essential in our uh, uh, patient and we should know that standard dialysis fluid, which we are usually using is only proper for hemodialysis and especially in low flux uh, membrane because it, a, a colony form unit allowance fee is a, 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 a 10 up to a, a square two, a colony form unit per milliliter, while the ultra pure dialysate, which is allowed for hemodialysis and HDF, have half of this colony form unit. And again, the endotoxin index in, in, in our standard health fluid, which is not measured in Egypt, by the way, is less than 0.5. While in the ultra pure dialysate, it should be less than 0.3. And then if you are going to uh, infuse solution from your 
uh, 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 water treatment unit, you should ensure sterile non pyrogenic substitution flows, which have better uh, sterilization to prevent infection for this patient. And of course, we know that contaminated blood, contaminated water is associated with chronic inflammation in our patient and poor outcome. What about uh, uh, vascular access? Vascular access, we all know that AV fistula is a preferred access. It's better than AV graft and it's better than permanent catheter. And we know that adequate dialysis depend on having a good axis that work well, and we should avoid poorly functioning axis. We shouldn't use it. Sometimes the nurse tell me, I disconnected the patient after two hours. Why? His fistula is not good. Usually, I will uh, punish this nurse. Why? She should not start this hemodialysis session. She should refer him to have a catheter, to have a proper dialysis, and then we will deal with the, with the fistula. Sometimes patients are escaping dialysis because of poor function fistula. So we have to, to, to target this issue clearly and properly. We know the rule of six. All of us know the rule of six. We need a fistula uh, 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 that should maturate in six weeks, minimum of six millimeter in diameter, and have uh, 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 less than six millimeter deep, and have a blood flow of more than 600 milli per minute and not more than one and a half or two, two liters, and should be evaluated in for maturation four to six weeks after surgical creation. And we should know that proper needle is needed if you target higher flow, because less needle gouge only allow very low uh, 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 flow rate. So the usual one we are using is 15 gouge or 14 gouge. It's 15 gouge or 450, which is a, 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 the best for our dialysis and also it's useful in hemodifiltration. Pump speed for our patient, the best is between 300 and 400. This is the best pump speed for our patient. Less than uh, uh, 300 is, is associated with less KTV or URR achievement, and higher than that is usually insignificant, except if you are going to do HDF. So we have now a, 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 a good water treatment and good vascular access we need to select good hemofilter. Hemofilter is not dependent only on flux, but it, it's dependent on the material and, and the uh, uh, porosity in the undulation. I will not tackle this issue because we have Professor Sham Said with us, but we have to mention that uh, 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 there are different type of hemodialyzer filter. Many of them have good characteristics and many of them had bad characteristics. Uh, porosity, pore size, pore distribution, all this will affect the performance of the hemodialyzer. And uh, uh, if, we, if, we, if we target middle molecule, which are the cause of chronic inflammation our patient like beta-2 microglobulin, we need to use a higher flux membrane. This, fortunately, and thanks to uh, 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 many of our colleagues, on the head of them, Professor Sham Said, he uh, 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 called upon using high flux membrane since more than 10 years, and it's now available in all our dialysis unit. And this is the best dialyzer in, 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 in hemodialysis, not only in Egypt, but worldwide. We have to use it because it has a very good uh, 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 sieving for uh, uh, not just low molecular weight uh, material, uh, uh, solutes or toxins, but also for uh, middle molecules, and we can use also uh, uh, high cutoff membrane or middle cutoff membrane. This membrane have increased pore size, and they, they can remove a lot of uh, 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 middle molecule, picrisol, uh, beta-2 microglobulin, uh, uh, BTH, and to avoid high cutoff membrane because they are associated with albumin loss, unless you are using them for special consideration. Again, we can ask Professor Hisham Said later on, uh, what is the best middle uh, 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 cutoff uh, 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 membrane to be used if we have it. And we should never use low flux membrane anymore because it only remove solutes, small solutes like urea and water and sodium. Again, if you want to increase the effect of the dialyzer or the, the dialysis to remove middle molecule, we can use 
HDF rather than regular hemodialysis because it has higher removal of vitamin globulin and amylase than other uh, than hemodialysis, the, the, the uh, uh, traditional hemodialysis. If you have hemodial filtration, you may use it. What about dialysis time? Time, to my mind, is everything in dialysis. If you have a small filter, uh, a small size filter, a low flux filter, and you have eight hours, you can achieve what you can achieve with better membrane for a small, uh, for a short time. So time is everything. And this is very clear. As early as this study in 2008, it showed that in Tassan group, which have low flux dialyzer, eight hours, three times per week, have be better survival than in those in Japan and those in, the, in Europe and the worst survival in the United States. United States are using the biggest hollow fiber with the higher flux, but less time. And Tassan is using low flux dialyzer with uh, extended time. So time is very important. And in this study, he was using keel dialyzer. I know that uh, no one from the young generation knows the keel dialyzer, but the professors, of course, remember keel dialyzer, which was a very low efficiency hemodialyzer. And also, the dialysis time, survival, is the best if you have more than 240 minutes, more than four hours, not less. And if you are just 30 minutes less, mortality increased by 19%. If you are less, just by 29 minutes. So the last 30 minutes is very important in the dialysis. And this is the difference in survival between Japan, Europe, and the United States. Although in Japan, they are using a very narrow needle, very low pump speed, and uh, uh, not large uh, hemodialyzer, but all their patients are receiving four and a half hours at least, while in the United States, they are, the average time on dialysis is three hours only. So time is everything in dialysis. And uh, 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 this is, uh, the, again, the DOPS showing that nowadays up to 80% only are receiving uh, 210 to 240 minutes. And uh, only 40% of patients in the DOPS USA up till now are receiving 240 minutes, which means complete four hours. So a lot of patients are still not yet achieving <clears throat> the target of 240 hours. And in Egypt, I think it is the same. Many patients are dialyzed less than four hours. Let us ask ourselves, if you have a patient with good biochemic, biochemical uh, uh, marker of dialysis, like potassium less than five, before dialysis, plasma concentration less than 5.5, bicarbonate more than 24, phosphorus less than 5.5 milligram per deciliter, and urea less than 35 millimole. He is uh, eating well, protein more than 1.2 gram, albumin more than four, cholesterol 200 to 300, and hemoglobin 11 to 12. Should we, this is a very, this is a target established by the Handbook of Dialysis by Dagger Das and uh, Rodriguez in 2019. These are the biochemical marker of good dialysis. If you have this marker, should you consider your patient a target or not? Okay, this is uh, uh, illustrated clearly in this study about reporting of dialysis adequacy. How can we report our dialysis adequacy if you have an, an auditing committee, anyone is saying, are you realizing your patient well? How to report? Reporting this parameter is very good, of course. If you achieve this parameter, this is great, but this is not enough. There is a lot of parameter. I know that you cannot read this, but it is uh, available <clears throat> on the internet. A lot of parameter. We are using just this parameter, the one I showed you, but there are a lot of parameters. And in spite of this, this parameter does not reflect alex of the else. Why? Because it only refers to biochemical outcome measure, most of which are not related with patient relevant outcome. For patients, adequate dialysis is a dialysis that enables them to spend as much quality time in their life as possible. So if you ask the patient, should you consider dialysis good if he is sensing well? 
if he has good appetite, if he has normal weight or more than normal weight or more natural skin color, and with good lab result, he say, yes, this is a good dialysis outcome. But if your patient has weakness or tiredness, has loss of body weight, poor appetite, repeated nausea or vomiting, or feeling, feeling better after treatment, <clears throat> or have bad skin color, or in, repeated infection, or bleeding, or premature death, lab result does not reflect good outcome, even if they are at the best. So reporting dialysis outcome is different. And let us look at this patient. He's telling his doctor, let me know if you want to know why I am here. I have a complaint. Although my lab is good, but I am not satisfied. That's why we need to put our patient at the center of our interest, at the center of our care. Doctor, nurses, dietitian, and social worker should encourage patients to represent themselves, to say patient, they should be engaged in their medication and treatment. And outside Egypt, Professor Sham has mentioned that in one of his presentation, there is what we, they call termination of dialysis. When the patient is not getting any benefit of dialysis, he might ask to stop dialysis and let him, uh, uh, he's suffering either way. Finally, we have to achieve good education, not only for the physician, but the patients and the nurses. And we, we, we should have charts for the patient to encourage them to reflect their needs in the, from dialysis. This will improve the outcome very much. And the else's outcome should not be only uh, about bioche biochemistry, but there is multi-dimensional assessment. Patient at the center of the assessment, his reported outcome by himself, patient reported outcome, uh, 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 solute removal, <clears throat> residual kidney function, and the, there is a strategy. We have to uh, 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 use the strategy to achieve that by duration, First, at the first one is the treatment duration, <clears throat> frequency, incremental dialysis, preservation of residual kidney function and concentration at home dialysis. And this should achieve the goals of maximizing quality of life and maximizing survival for the patient. So dialysis treatment, we should all remember it is prescribed as a dose of medicine, time, dialyzer, water, hemoglobin, heart disease, CKD, MBD, everything should be prescribed like a medication. And we should add life to our patient. We shouldn't add years to, the, to them, but we have to, 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 to add life to this uh, uh, patient. And there is no such thing as too much dialysis as some people claim, but usually patients are getting too little. And finally, I'd like to invite you to our Egyptian annual dialysis conference that will be held from 7 to 9th October uh, under supervision of uh, uh, Shams University and uh, uh, Vice President of uh, the Egyptian Society of Nephrology, Professor Shams Said, and uh, uh, under uh, uh, ISN and Era Eritha, Egyptian Society of Nephrology, AFRAN, and Inter International Society of Hemodialysis. Thank you very much, and sorry if I am, I've took too long time. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Magdish and Awi. It is a, a very big panoramic view for highlighting all of the uh, issues in the prescription of hemodialysis. We really enjoyed such a uh, talk, and I think uh, each slide, each magnificent slide, could be additionally a separate talk. So uh, thank you again, and I will, uh, if you allow me to, uh, some comments just to advertise the audience to go ahead for the questions. Uh, I also believe that in all your uh, slides, and I'm very thankful for that. And if you uh, ask me how the patient feeling of adequacy or how the perception of the patient is uh, in adequate dialysis beyond a nephrologist view of KT over V. I think five additional items should be uh, in focus for the patient view, uh, which is no pain, no depression, can travel, can move everywhere 
uh, and can eat uh, freely uh, as well uh, the patient can enjoy his life. So this is a, a true patient need from hemodialysis. Additional uh, view is almost needed for treating depression, psychological uh, improving the condition and the uh, hemodialysis uh, uh, attacking the patient almost have one day of dialysis and additional day of dialysis, but it is completely fatigued. So uh, additional five points we can add for the hemodialysis uh, prescription, like depression, pain, enjoying three days, being between dialysis, can travel as well, can eat well. Additional point is uh, we all agree that dialysis is a preaching to uh, the transplantation. But why we are not satisfied by dialysis in just two words. The means of dialysis is, it is not physiological, meaning that intermittency of the therapy and the shorter duration uh, of the therapy makes uh, it non-physiological. Additional one for the non-physiological way, we are using dialysis with lower CV coefficient. So we cannot remove all the, of the uremic toxins. The third way, we are lacking the tubular function. So bioartificial kidney on dialysis can improve uh, the condition of the metabolic uh, issue in hemodialysis. So this is the method in dialysis. Uh, one slide you perfectly applied for the uh, pure water and the ultra pure, but I am uh, just to say, the, even if you are using low flux, you have to use uh, ultra pure water because endotoxin fragments can pass the low flux dialyzer by diffusion process. Its molecular weight usually below 5,000. So uh, I highly recommend to use ultra pure water or ultra pure dialysis for all patients if uh, you are using low flux or high flux. Last comment, not all high flux are the same. So not all the uh, term of high flux has the same uh, terminology because it depends largely on the sieving coefficient, how much could be uh, removed. So now we can uh, move to the question and I am sure that we will have an answer. Uh, all, all of the uh, one here are uh, talking about your magnificent talk. I fully agree on that. Thank you. And I will ask, uh, you some questions. One is the uh, question is uh, coming from Shanna. She's talking about the uh, one type of dialyzer, uh, SX80. Is high flux or not? Yes, it's high flux. Second question is I know there is three methods of calculating of KTV. Which one of uh, them is the practical one? Professor Magdi. I think you, you should use single uh, pool, which is uh, uh, clearly, I, I, I will show you the website where uh, Professor Degredes has a, a formula that's very easy to use. You can fill this formula and you can get your KTV easily. You have some machines now can calculate KTV. <clears throat> it's available in Egypt. It can online, be... online clearance monitoring. Yes, can you... yes. Mm -hmm. no, online camera. Oh. So okay. you see, if you can do it, you can just do your rear reduction ratio which is much easier, much more easier, and as same informative as single pool KTV. Yes, it's a practical point, yes. Uh, another uh, important uh, question is uh, from Asma. Uh, I need to ask if patient sickle cell anemia, we have to do uh, with him with the uh, epotherapy or not? A very good yes. question. Yes, in sickle cell anemia, if he is an end stage kidney disease patient, of course, it's very difficult to give him iron. You have to measure iron, ferritin, and TSAT because this patient have usually hem hemolysis. So their iron might not be high. But if he, if, he have, if the patient have iron deficiency anemia, you can treat him with iron because it's not just sickling that's the cause of anemia, but the renal disease itself, the dialysis itself can cause anemia. And so you can correct by giving uh, uh, some patient will need EPO. Of course, the best way, the best way to treat sickle cell anemia, not the best way, but the most available way is repeated blood transfusion. And if he is in need for repeated blood transfusion, there is no need to give him EPO. But if you know, not, 
not all cycling uh, result in the same level of hemoglobin and not all the time he is anemic. He has a cycling uh, attack. During this attack, usually he will need blood. Uh, otherwise, you can treat him like any other CKD patient. Yes, uh, also in sickle uh, cell anemia, we have uh, uh, probably a medical splenectomy due to repeated infarction. So we have to take care about also the platelets count and function and as well for the infection. So uh, sickle cell anemia on dialysis needs uh, more attention in multifactorial uh, effects. Uh, uh, another question is, can I start ACE inhibitors in CKD patients? CKD or dialysis patient? In, in dialysis, yes, you can. In CKD patient, you have to monitor uh, uh, GFR or serum creatinine uh, after- as well, serum uh, potassium, yes. Yes, and you have check uh, potassium after one week, two weeks, and every month after using uh, ACE, if it is badly indicated, especially for heart disease. Yes. Uh, one question uh, as well from very active uh, audience here, Asma again. Uh, yeah, it seems that Asma and Nagwa and some others are questioning uh, a lot, which means are interesting in the talk. Uh, what's your action plan for patients with low albumin and swole low Catabolic ratio, normalized protein catabolic ratio. A very good question. And uh, again, uh, as the Professor Hashem mentioned, <clears throat> we will have a special uh, presentation on each item. We have presentation on nutrition. This patient will need enteral support. Enteral support, uh, you can give it uh, orally or uh, intravenously. You can give your patient oral uh, 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 protein uh, containing supplement to correct his anemia. And also you can give him intravenous, you know, intravenous uh, uh, amino acids are available in our centers. You can give him with each dialysis intravenous amino acid. But let me tell you the first line you do it. You should ask why this patient is catabolic and you treat the catabolism. The most important cause of catabolism is inflammation. Your patient is inflamed. Why he is inflamed? If he is using a catheter, this is the main issue. If he is under dialyzed, another issue. If his hemodialyzer is not good, this is a third issue. If the water treatment unit is not using ultra pure dialysate, this is a fourth issue. So you start with asking yourself why he is catabolic to correct it, and then you can give him either uh, oral supplement or IV supplement to correct uh, albumin. Yes, we know that uh, uh, low albumin in patients on dialysis has four major causes. One is the higher catabolic issue uh, due to inflammation. Uh, one additional factor is low production due to chronic liver disease. And a third type uh, is due to albumin loss due to medium cut off or high cut off uh, dialysis membrane or even hemodiafiltration. And I strongly suggesting that if patients need hemodiafiltration with low albumin, you should go to pre-dilution and not post-dilution because in post-dilution there is higher albumin loss. And the uh, last factor for low serum albumin is the dilutional effect from uh, the uh, hypervolemia. So uh, there is some questions on the anemia management. Uh, coming uh, questions is, what's your plan for low hemoglobin with high protein? Can we give iron medication and how uh, to uh, treat low hemoglobin in such cases? Again, very, very interesting question. Yes, if you have higher ferritin and persistent anemia, if the patient has persistent anemia in spite of high ferritin, you have to measure iron and T-set. If T-set is low, less than 30, I think, you can give him IV iron. There are some trials of pushing higher iron in patient with ferritin because uh, there may be uh, inefficient iron uh, utilization. It might not be just iron deficiency, but the body cannot utilize iron. You can push more iron and see because ferritin will not kill the patient. One other issue with ferritin again is a marker of inflammation, is a marker of liver disease and many of our patients has hepatitis C Although, uh, in, thank God, it will be gone uh, very soon from Egypt, but we still have patients with liver disease and ferritin does not just reflect iron status. And you can give EPO. You can give EPO to this patient 
you can maximize the EPO. But when there is no response to EPO, I myself, I give uh, uh, iron uh, trial for one or two months and many patients will respond, but there are also some trial who's using vitamin C. Vitamin C, especially in low doses, not more than 250 milligram with each, uh, with, with each session or orally daily, not more than 250 milligram. It can improve uh, utilization of iron and can improve anemia in such patients. Yes, as a clinical use, uh, probably 20 years ago, the the uh, uh, dosing of vitamin C in a very low dose can improve uh, the anemia. Yes. Uh, another question is, is the time of dialysis coming from Dr. Sayed, uh, time of dialysis related to efficacy of dialyzer more than four hours effect on efficacy of a dialyzer? I, I, I can't understand what the question, but it seems that uh, uh, the four hours dialysis or more, the dialyzer is still efficient or not. I think, I think the answer is easy. Of course, if you are using a good dialyzer, I will answer the question in, in, in both ways, because I understand that if you, if, you, if you are using a good dialyzer, can you reduce time? The answer is clearly no. Yes. A minimum of four hours is a must. This is the first answer. Second, yes, uh, uh, the hemodialyzer can survive up to six and eight hours if you are using it properly and if you give good uh, anticoagulation to your patient. Yes, you can use it up to uh, six hours. I think the maximum of, of regular hemodialysis, uh, especially in, in practice, is five to five and a half hours, especially in, in patients who have overload. And uh, as the Dr. Des mentioned, yes, yes the, in this time. Yes, Dr. Yes. Shem. Yes, yes, the uh, uh, abilities and the functionality of a dialyzer beyond the six hours, yes, is still working with the uh, all, nearly all types of the membranes because they're hydrophilicity, but you, you have to think about the consistency of the clearance uh, value. Uh, another way is the important thing is the renal, uh, is the, sorry, is the uh, cutules or the what's called the bloodline. The blood line exhaustion as well is important. The bump segment is important to check about the actual blood flow. But in general, uh, around six hours, you have a uh, well-functioning uh, dialysis membrane. Uh, in a question uh, asking about the US and uh, the reuse process, I think it's uh, nowadays, Absolutely. it's not of the practice yet of uh, reusing dialysis because we got the high flux, nearly half a euro difference in pricing. And thank you for the research and development we did. Uh, uh, any rule of machine type in dialysis adequacy? The uh, answer is no. It should be uh, well calibrated and well function machine, whatever the type, all of them are uh, for sure volumetric. Action plan for a high phosphate and a high calcium. Well, this is <laughs> another another question that needs another presentation. Yes, uh, but I think I think I, I can answer uh, part of that. You describe the uh, parathyroid hormone removal during yes. dialysis. Yes. Some of the solids, although, could be removed on dialysis as a molecular weight, but not removed efficiently, including that the. Uh, parathermal because it's uh, 9,000 Dalton. It's uh, smaller than beta 2 microglobulin, but it's uh, coming from a very dynamic way. So the removal of the PTH during dialysis is rapidly equilibrated by the parathyroid gland. What is, is uh, uh, another is the dialytic calcium to suppress the parathyroid hormone is another issue, including is that the phosphor. What is the rule of dialysis in phosphate removal? The equivalence between low flux, high flux, and hemodiafiltration in removing because the state has a third party uh, uh, inside the body, including the bones and the other 99%. So removal of the state does not make sense uh, in controlling the uh, whatever the low flux or high flux. 
but the time factor is the main issue to uh, improve the overall uh, phosphate removal, which is around uh, 700 during uh, a single dialysis dose. Uh, Let me add again, uh, yes, yeah, sure. If you are using daily dialysis, you can remove a lot of phosphorus. If you're using yes. more frequent dialysis. Yes, but the uh, daily dialysis will be on the expense of the cost and uh, on the yes. expense of the uh, arteriovenous fistula. So I, I, as well for the patient uh, living days in, uh, in between dialysis, so I think uh, longer dialysis uh, will be better than more frequent dialysis, although both of them can improve the phosphate. Uh, what about dialysis prescription regarding time? QP dialyzer type for adult patients, weight uh, 40 kilograms. Uh, this is a very, very important question. I remember uh, uh, two years ago when uh, we were together, me and Professor Hashem in the annual dialysis conference in Dallas, and we, we, we have a, a lecture, a presentation about dialysis in children. You know that in most children, they give them three hours, and this is completely incorrect. The lower the weight, the less the size, the more the time you, 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 you need. And I, I mentioned clearly that in young and uh, uh, low weight and in females, more time is needed. So 40 kilogram does not mean you give him three hours. You, can, you should give him enough dialysis, four hours. And again, the outcome of dialysis is not measured by biomarkers. It is measured by dialysis outcome. Patient, if he is not gaining weight, he's not dialyzed well. If he's not eating well, he's not dialyzed well. If he's not growing, he's not eating well, he's not dialyzed well. So this is additional parameters for the adequacy. Uh, I hope that Mustafa, uh, who asking this question, is satisfied from the answer. Uh, coming to uh, ASF, patient on CRRT in ICU, we start him hemodialysis. Can prescribe at first session or can prescribe usual prescription he was on, on continuous uh, dialysis. Uh, I, I, if I understand what the question, you mean that uh, the dose of CRRT in patients on maintenance hemodialysis or the patient with acute kidney injury for post CRRT is additional issue and it's uh, very slow. Uh, don't fear about the disequilibrium because the dose is uh, very slow and uh, can achieve uh, the target. Uh, Again, considering the hemoglobin and the erythropoietin doses, uh, how we can reduce or stop erythropoietin, it's dependent on the guidelines between 10 and 12. You should not stop erythropoietin, but we have to reduce the dose or increase, or increase the duration in between the doses, but never to stop completely, except if there is complication like cerebrovascular stroke or additional complications. <laughs> From Asna again, uh, well questions. For increased QP for patients with cardiac problem, but stable, will make problem for our patients 350 and 40, 400? I think not. There is no difference between the pump speed. The only issue in this patient is AV fistula flow. This will affect his cardiac condition, but 350 to 400 will not affect. Uh, you, you know the dialyzer and the, the hemofilter can only contain a 150 to 100 milliliter of blood. And the pump speed doesn't make any difference except if there is symptoms. So if he's symptomatic with this uh, uh, high rate or if he developed tachycardia, you should start slowly and uh, build up the speed gradually. By the way, the difference between 300 and 400 doesn't make any change in his target uh, KTV or you are R, and you can extend just 10 minutes to uh, substitute for this pump speed. So if the patient is not complaining, 400 is good. The only issue is when you initiate fistula in a heart failure patient, don't do it approximately, do it distally, please. Sometimes it's a controversy about that, I may add that we have two types of free circulation. One is the arterial venous free circulation, and we'll know that. Uh, from stenosis, and one is the longer arm 
of uh, recirculation, which is the cardiopulmonary recirculation. Meaning that the blood pump from the heart go to two spaces, one to the fistula for the dialysis and one to the tissue to come back with the toxin. So if you have a very high flow and you expand the, uh, all the blood flow in heart failure to the fistula needle and to the blood coming from the patient to the machine, you decrease the blood flow to the tissue. And meaning that the tissue which is rich in toxins will not move again to the dialysis. So the, what's called the cardiopulmonary recirculation, meaning that the blood is not going efficiently to the tissue, peripheral tissue to get back the toxins and come measure of that to the uh, dialysis. So uh, if uh, you have more than 30% of the cardiac output coming to the dialysis, you will have a lower dialysis dose and a higher rebound. So make sure about that and be uh, considered. What is the value of bicarbonate uh, patterns on the dialysis machine? It is uh, a pattern that you can increase the bicarbonate. But uh, Professor Tariq Tantawi uh, described uh, individualization, and I think that the upper limit of bicarbonate of uh, 34 uh, uh, millimole is enough, don't exceed, because if you exceed, you may make uh, alkalosis, and you make rebound of hyperkalemia, because higher alkali moves the potassium to the cells during dialysis, and subsequently, Immediately after dialysis, the potassium would shift from the cells and the risk of hyperkalemia. So the patterns for increasing the bicarbonate level, but never to exceed 34. Uh, another question, what is about anticoagulation heparin versus regional sulfate on dialysis outcome? I think I think we don't have this kind of anticoagulation in Egypt, so we we, we shouldn't uh, talk about it a lot. Citrate anticoagulation need calcium replacement post uh, hemodialyzer. It's usually used with CRRT when there is a prolonged time of anticoagulation, 48 hours. It's not used in hemodialysis. I don't advise you to use it in hemodialysis. You, if you don't like heparin, or if you don't want heparin because of a heat or a hypersensitivity, you can use heparin-free sessions. It can control up to four hours with heparin-free. But citrate, we don't have experience with it. We have the knowledge, we don't have the experience. So this is my advice. Uh, another question, I may answer that. How to overcome blood streaking in dialysis? Blood streaking in some time, uh, inevitable uh, factor during hemodialysis. But how you can uh, overcome that or decrease? Number one, with a very good priming time to eliminate all air because air will have a streaking because it's against the blood flow. Give the patient uh, before uh, starting dialysis a good priming time, the aeration. Then use a correct blood flow because if you are using a very big dialyzer like uh, 1.8 and above 2.0 with a low flow there is stagnation of the blood in the periphery and you will have uh, blood streaking so if you are using bigger dialyzer you should have a bigger flow because the blood pump speed uh, inside the dial the flow speed inside the dialyzer in the periphery is 50 percent just 50 percent of the uh, center of the filter, so uh, higher blood flow as well should overcome the uh, blood streaking. Finally, uh, look for uh, recirculation. Some patients have a very uh, recirculation percent, and this will make uh, streaking. So check for the fistula and the recirculation. Question for you from Muhammad Ali: uh, Acute hyponatremia. AKI requiring hemodialysis. What is the proper dialysis sodium? 
is serum sodium 120. Uh, for hyponatremia, if uh, in hemodialysis patient, if he is already a chronic hemodialysis patient, you have to investigate the course first because it's not common. Uh, uh, usually, this patient has liver disease or uh, uh, have uh, some serious condition, but you have to adjust dialysate uh, sodium not more than 140. Whatever his sodium is, don't use uh, more than that. The best sodium concentration is between 135 and 138. This is the ideal, and it will correct any kind of hyponatremia, but you may need uh, to do frequent hemodialysis <coughs> treating hyponatremia by hemodialysis. Again, don't give the patient high salt diet. This will not correct his hyponatremia. Uh, this patient are usually, uh, if, if this is true in hemodialysis patient, he's in grave condition and he should be hospitalized and well investigated. But if you are asking what the dialysate sodium, don't go more than 140, please. Sometimes if you are uh, in patient with acute hyponatremia, meaning that uh, uh, before 48 hours, there is no rest. But if you have a chronic hyponatremia, meaning that above uh, uh, 48 hours, you, ha you may decrease the conductivity of sodium uh, more or less around 10 to 12 above the serum sodium, if it's a true hyponatremia, not a dilutional one. Because if you have a dilutional hyponatremia from the hypovolemia, uh, don't fear of increasing sodium in the dialysis. Uh, from Ahmed Fahmi, how to compensate for iron deficiency in CKD non-dialysis? It is the same for uh, patients on dialysis, but usually, can you give the peripheral iron freely for uh, CKD on not on dialysis? It is feasible for patients. You need a hospitalization. Yes, we can. We can give parenteral iron. Yes, we can give him uh, IV. And sometimes we can use intramuscular iron, yes. Yes, we can use it uh, cautiously, but we need uh, for sure hospitalization, not at all. Hemodialysis in pregnant women, uh, we write that in uh, our, from Hossein Mustafa, in our uh, Egyptian hemodialysis guideline, you need at least five to six sessions and uh, around 20 to 24 uh, hours of dialysis uh, per week. Uh, I think can start our parental, but in all patients must advise to dialyze online to improve outcome of dialysis. I think this uh, Sapah, I think uh, you mean online hemodial filtration? <laughs> uh, if you mean that uh, hemodial filtration, no, we cannot apply hemodial filtration for all patients. Patient on incremental dialysis does not need hemodial filtration at all because they have residual kidney function. Patient on long vintage of dialysis, more five years, or has a cardiac problem, intradialytic hypotension, beta-2 microglobin amyloidosis, neuropathy, or additional complication may be perfect from online hemodial filtration. The usual percent is about 20 to 25% of patients will need hemodial filtration. Again, if your patient is malnourished with low serum albumin or with hypercoagulation, go ahead with pre-dilutional, not post-dilution hemodial filtration. Okay. This patient from Ahmed uh, Abaza, uh, we have two patients in our unit with low phosphate level 1.5 and the hypoparathyroidism, which is a dynamic bone disease and with low phosphates, meaning that uh, very bad uh, nutrition. Yes, I agree. When we can stop, as uh, it's from inside, when uh, can stop dialysis in multi-organ failure uh, in ICU patients, I think you can stop only when the patient dies. What's the role of heparin versus calixan? Uh, uh, low molecular weight heparin uh, is uh, required, but be sure that its duration of action is around 12 hours, uh, while the uh, liver regular heparin is a couple of hours. So if you have a risk of bleeding, don't go to low molecular weight, but use uh, uh, high molecular weight or short acting uh, heparin for fear of bleeding.
how to treat patient every session have allergy from dialyzer disinfection material uh, it is not called disinfection because disinfection does not mean sterilization there is a big difference between disinfection and sterilization uh, if you are using uh, it's the allergy if you are using steam you can do more priming and the flushing or change the polymer or change the membrane if you are using polysulfone, you can go to polyamide or polyether sulfone may solve. But uh, first of all, you have to do very good priming uh, to elute more of the polymers retaining inside the dialog. Relationship between conductivity and good dialysis, there is no relation, but you have to use isotonic uh, fluid. So conductivity 12 is not isotonic and it will induce hemolysis. If you are used conductivity above uh, 14, it will induce osmosis and the patient will get hypernatremia. So P in the isotonic field. Question for you, Dr. Magdi, severe hypertension during dialysis patient. What's the rule? Mm, severe, it's sometime we have patient with severe hypertension during hemodialysis, first you have to revise his medications because some of the uh, uh, antihypertensive medication are dialyzable. And again, this is another presentation, a complete presentation that you need to attend. Uh, okay. First, revise his medication. Second, uh, check his dry weight because as I mentioned, 80% of hypertension in dialysis is volume dependent. Three, you have to uh, start the dialysis. Sometimes there is a very bad uh, advice for the nurses and for the physician. If the patient is hypertensive, don't start the dialysis. No, you can go ahead with the dialysis. You be cautious with the heparin, but you can start the dialysis because this will remove the excess fluid and will allow you to treat his hypertension. Then you can give him short acting antihypertensive medication like Captobrel. Don't give him uh, 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 nifedipine, it's contraindicated. <laughs> Don't use uh, 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 the nitride batch that is usually prescribed. This is not indicated for antihypertensive emergency. You can use a captoprel sublingual once or twice until you control blood pressure. Please start the dialysis, start your ultrafiltration and revise the medication and then intensify medication if it's actually have persistent hypertension. Uh, for sure that uh, beside you have to review the antihypertensive. Don't use a dialyzable uh, drugs. Uh, so you can give alpha beta blocker, which is good. You can use S inhibitor in, uh, instead of a, uh, ARBs instead of uh, S inhibitor because most of ARBs are not dialyzable. So you have to check again the antihypertensive protocol and the change to non-dialyzable. Uh, question coming from Dr. Jamila. I think Dr. Jamila, we can say hi to Jamila from Libya, I think. And uh, her question is, is there a rule of, this, of prescribing or describing sodium individually according to patient uh, serum sodium uh, pre-dialysis? The answer, yes, but it is not practical to measure serum sodium every session. You have to put a range of sodium except in patient with severe hyponatremia, not due to hypervolemia, but due to uh, another co uh, cause. Uh, one question in Arabic, but I will translate. Uh, if the patient on CRRT, if the patient is on CRRT and the patient is good and need to start dialysis uh, immediately uh, for the first time, uh, but uh, or after the CRRT, can we treat him as a first patient? No, you can treat him if he is previously dialyzed as a CRRT. You can do intermittent hemodialysis as in patient with maintenance hemodialysis, not in escalating doses or time. What is the complication coming from Rania? Uh, uh, hello, Rania. What is the complication for removal? More than 13 ml per kg per hour per patient. You, you need that very, uh, very tough ultrafiltration can induce organ stunning. 
and can induce sudden uh, arrhythmia and uh, uh, of course uh, organ stunning can induce uh, to the cardiac stunning mainly and ischemic changes which lead to fibrosis and later on to heart failure. So please don't go above 13 because it's related very closely to mortality. Many patients uh, from PAMI have numerous about heparin like blindness. I don't understand like blindness. The, the, patient is blind uh, or not blind. I think he may, he, he, some patients are afraid of uh, uh, heparin because it causes blindness. This is true only in diabetic patients with a proliferative retina. neuropathy. Yeah, it's it can induce vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, yeah, it can induce vitreous hemorrhage and true. equivalent low molecular weight versus high molecular weight, I think, uh, in, in this condition. Can S or R used for patients with intradialytic hypertension? I prefer ARBs because it's not dialyzable like it. Which are the contraindications for dialysis for patients either low or high? Uh, it depends on the situation. There is no contraindication for high blood pressure. But if the patient is shocked and is normokalemic, you have to decide what is the cause of uh, shock below 100. If it is abnormal for this patient, but sometimes patients presented, especially on longer dialysis vintage, due to loss of the renin from the non-functioning kidneys, and the patient may be presented by systolic blood pressure around 110, but is still completely stable. There is no contraindication for that. In the root for vitamin D3, in patients with low PKH post-paraperidectomy, We'll keep this answer for the CKD MBD talk. Patients with the residual kidney function can ask to be used for intrathetic hypotension. We answer. So, this is all the question. I would like to hear from the expertise here. We have Professor Farid Tantawi, Professor Saeed Hamid, Professor Yasser uh, Abdel Hamid. Please use the mic and say your words. Professor Hisham, Professor Magni, uh, can I have uh, some comments? Yes, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yes, Mr. President, how are you? <laughs> Professor Alman. How are you, sir? Thank you very much. Thank you, <laughs> Professor Magni, uh, yani, for your impressive and informative presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And I enjoyed much. also the smart moderation and comments of Professor Hisham Say. Uh, Thank you very much. You are, uh, you are uh, really two pillars in hemodialysis science. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, I like also to to uh, stress um, upon certain uh, issues and points uh, Professor Magdi raised in his talk. First, the nutrition and good protein diet is very important. And I think the policy of protein restriction should be completely prohibited from our nephrology practice. <clears throat> uh, as it, uh, it, it carry a lot of hazards and deleterious effect on the patient. Number two, time is very important and crucial in the dialysis prescription. As you mentioned, yes. whatever the quality of the dialyzers used. Number three, and I think it's very important that the clinical judgment and assessment of dialysis adequacy the appetite, the fitness and sense of well-being, the skin color, etc., are very important. And dependence on the um, complicated and sophisticated formulas and the equations are not always needed. So uh, I thank you very much, uh, Professor Magdi, for uh, your thank you. very, very elegant presentation. And uh, thank you, Professor Hisham. Thank you, Professor, thank you, Professor Ayman. Thank you very much. Professor Yasser, uh, please give your words. Uh, thank you, Professor Magdi, for your uh, highly elegant talk, as usual. Uh, we enjoyed it much and enjoyed the discussion guided by Professor Hisham and you. It was another lecture, uh, adding to the talk. The discussion could be considered another lecture. And I would stress to the same point, Professor Ayman said, in addition, that the amount of ultrafiltration, amount of uh, blood pumping, possible blood pumping that you uh, stressed on in the start of your talk. 
I have I have two questions, if you please. Uh, I I felt that you encourage blood transfusion in dialysis patient. This is a feeling uh, that I get. Uh, what about your opinion about regarding a young patient, 25 years old, for example? Uh, do you? Yeah. Type of fishing? Uh, I, I didn't hear the question. Can you repeat it? The professor asked. Uh, the guy, young patients preparing for transplantation. Yes, yes. Opinion regarding blood transfusion in this. No, situation? no, no. I don't like blood transfusion whatsoever. But it is a. a it, it's this is still, different from what. Yeah. <laughs> this is different it's from still, what we it's still in the guideline, because yes, you know uh, sometimes. Except an emergency, yes. Except an emergency, yes. but. If, if there yes. is acute loss this is of the blood, I want to use the stress, please. Yes, but my patients, especially I, I, I used to transplant patients. I, 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 I am the head of transplantation unit. I advised all the colleagues never to give blood uh, in young patient preparing for transplantation, even that we have in our unit in, and even in the Merdash hospital, we have washed and irradiated blood if we want, but still it carries risk of uh, sensitization. And we will suffer yes. a lot after that. No, even I don't from, like... even from donor. If you have a donor already, and, and yes. if you have a if you have even, a donor, even, and yes, uh, even from the donor, yes, I can. I'm not encouraging transfusion ever, especially if the patient is not symptomatic. If if he is if he can tolerate uh, anemia, I can correct iron. Uh, cor uh, uh, every session, I give him iron. Every session to correct iron stores. Rapidly, I give him uh, the, the maximum tolerated dose of EPO and the proper nutritional dialysis. And I will uh, accelerate his transplantation process. And then we may give him a blood transfusion after transplantation. But I'm, I'm against blood transfusion whatsoever. The cutoff, I, I said to my resident, don't give blood transfusion unless uh, hemoglobin is less than seven and in a symptomatic patient. Yes, and and acutely, and acutely, blood yes. loss. You should be uh, below seven. <laughs> intolerant, intolerant uh, to dialysis, even and acutely uh, blood loss. My second question is about the neurological experience, Professor Magdi, and of course, Professor Hisham. Uh, uh, do you feel? Uh, do you have a preference for one preparation of uh, erythropoietin than others? I think not. The, the only the only difference is the effectiveness. Sometimes we are using yes. the cheap one, and it is effective. I think yes. the issue here is the preservation. The the, yes. the, the problem with the, the cheap or, or the generic one, they don't preserve it in a cool place. They are not treating them well. Mm -hmm. And the most uh, the expensive one, the the, the uh, original one, are keeping them in a very good temperature until the patient is receiving them. But as you know. There is some of the generics are very good, and even some of the good ones are not good. And I, I have an experience, and I think you too, not all yes. patients respond to the same uh, uh, erythropoietin. Some uh, will respond to the longer duration, some will yes. respond to uh, epoietin alpha, some to epoietin beta, some to others. I, I think as well, uh, Professor uh, Magdi, they, when you are calling generic, uh, generic in general means that same efficacy. So if if below efficacy, it's not generic even. They so it's a drug. Yes. It's a drug, but we don't know what is it. So uh, generic means same efficacy, but not from the brand type. Yes. Uh, that's a good question. The experiences in erythropoietin nowadays is in the IV during hemodialysis, which means that IV doses should be changed as well. A lot of countries are shifting from subcutaneous during hemodialysis to IV, but not all erythropoietin has the same efficacy in IV rather than subcutaneous route. So you have to increase the dose. Thank you, professors. Uh, Professor Faisal Shane is with us. Uh, Professor Faisal, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, indeed. I enjoyed the talk very much, Majdi. You were thank excellent you as usual. You're, you're most uh, welcome, Professor Faisal. Yes, Welcome, Professor Faisal. Thank you. And the discussion of Hisham, as usual, uh, he's the star of the night. Thank you uh, very much, Professor. Uh, actually, I sent one question. We, are, we, we have hemodial filtration uh, and also high flux dialyzer 
is this is make a lot of impact. This is expensive things. It make a lot of impact on mortality and morbidity of the dialysis patient. Let me let me answer you first, and then I will uh, uh, let the Professor Hisham answer. To okay. my mind, there is no difference between a proper high flux dialyzer, dialysis, in in good time with very uh, 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 pure or ultra pure dialysate. If it, it's 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 well done, the difference between hemodialysis filtration hemodialysis uh, with with this uh, uh, high flux membrane is not that big. And one other issue, HDF is not usually achieving 21 liters for all patients. That's that's why if you are not targeting 21 liters, it's the same, exactly the same, if not less than hemodialysis. I, I will let Professor Shami, of course, he is he knows better. Uh very good questions. The difference between high flux and hemodial filtration is the dragging force. So if you're coming for a dialyzer with a sitting coefficient, for example, cannot remove above 20,000 or 20,005. So if you are using the same dialyzer in hemodial filtration due to dragging force by the hemodial filtration technique, especially in the post dilution one, you may remove up to 40,000. So if you have a patient, for example, with inflammation, is it first the high flux or hemodial filtration? No, it's hemodial filtration because it removes bigger toxins, even if they are using the same dialyzer. Another example, if you are using patients with myeloma, with free light chain, using high flux or hemodial filtration? No, hemodial filtration is better because it's expanding the membrane to about 40 or 45,000 dialyzers. This is the true uh, indication, especially patients with beta 2 microglobulin amyloidosis, because it is not the molecule of beta 2 microglobulin. Beta 2 microglobulin is innocent in inducing the uh, uh, complication. It needs to be changed in the molecular structure by cytokines. So if you have a beta 2 microglobulin without cytokines, you will not have a complication. That's clear why not all patients with low flux dialysis does not develop beta-2 microglobulin deposition in joints. But if you have a true beta-2 microglobulin deposition like carpal tunnel syndrome, you'll be sure that cytokines is a major player and you have to do hemodifiltration. So in general practice, hemodifiltration will improve some of the required uh, dialysis population and will not improve another sector of patient. It depends on your uh, philosophy, which site, uh, which uh, molecule uh, needs to be removed during that. Thank you. By, by the way, Professor Faisal, in the United States, they are not using HDF whatsoever. And in yeah, Europe, that's it's why I asked this 60%, question. 60% only on HDF. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is the cost effectiveness. Yeah. Because especially in the era of, of exp extremely costly dialysis. This FDA, 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 why, why hemodial filtration is not available in, in USA? Simply because FDA does not, does not approve filtration as a method of sterilization. So you are infusing your patient with at least 30 liters. You say it's trial. Which type of sterilization is filtration? And filtration in the FDA is not a trial. You need either steam, gamma, whatever heat. So that's why uh, US uh, are not using hemodial filtration. And we all know that hemodial filtration cost from high flux is low than 10 uh, US dollars. Uh, so it's, Shem, what about Japan also? They are not using HDF. No, they are using HDF and okay. they are using what's called no, they are using hemodial filtration uh, yes, largely. It's generalized for the patients, for some patients. Never, no countries are universally used hemodial filtration, except in some countries like Switzerland, uh, who are using a lot of hemodial filtration. But hemodial filtration is not a prescription for all. No one size fit for all. You need to uh, select uh, your patient for uh, hemodial filtration. Great. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you, Professor Peter. Uh, we have Professor Said Khamis.
Welcome, Professor Said. Welcome, Professor Yasser. Uh, thank you, Professor Magdi, for this elegant presentation, as usual. And thank thanks uh, for his comments and his uh, valuable uh, uh, instructions, always. Uh, just uh, I wanted to comment uh, regarding uh, the hemodial filtration asked by Professor Faisal. Uh, as you know, Professor Hisham, if you remember, just uh, we we conducted one presentation a few months ago in the conference of ASMT. Uh, and you know, where uh, five uh, randomized controlled trials, well known con randomized controlled trials regarding the efficacy of uh, hemodial filtration versus high flux uh, hemodial. And all of them showed that superiority of hemodial filtration uh, to uh, uh, versus this uh, high flux dialysis. In the meantime, uh, in Japan, as you know, that 30% there is uh, on uh, hemodial filtration. And uh, yes. uh, the majority of hemodial filtration on, uh, regarding, I mean, worldwide in, in Europe, especially France and Switzerland and so. So hemodial filtration is coming for sure, and they progress. But maybe there are some logistic, uh, obviously, in the cost effectiveness, as Professor Magdi said. But we cannot deny that uh, the superiority of hemodial filtration, I mean, efficacy or adequacy wise, or removal of uh, middle molecules. Because, as you know, that conviction is, uh, I mean, conviction as a physical principle for this uh, hemodial filtration. Mimicking, almost mimicking the uh, natural kidney, I mean the native kidney function. So we cannot deny the superiority of the hemodial filtration. Second and the last point is uh, uh, dialysis, post dialysis fatigue. Post dialysis fatigue is a very common problem, as Dr. Maggi touched it rapidly in his lecture. But we should throw light or focus on this issue actually, because it is very major problem for our patient. And it is one of the major uh, uh, issues to be assessed regarding the adequacy of dialysis. If you remember, Professor Hisham, these 16 items of optimal dialysis, only one item for KT over B, if you remember, I think it was put by uh, the Camp Lantar Zada in Kidney International a few years ago. 16 items, only one item is KT over B. So there are many items to be focused on, especially this dialysis fatigue and the dialysis recovery time. And thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dr. Saeed a very, very, very common figure and a very eminent figure uh, for your talk during the ESNET as well in the fatigue. And if you uh, uh, allow me that I highlight the cardinal patient needs, not our nephrology. We are focusing on KT over V. What is the true patient need? Depression, pain, can enjoy in between dialysis time, can have a free day to enjoy, can travel, and can eat without limitation. This is a true dialysis adequacy from uh, uh, our uh, point of view to be put beside anemia, CKD, MBD, and the other factors. For the Japanese, yes, they are doing a lot of hemodial filtration, and the rest are using what's called high performance membranes, meaning that they allowed some albumin leak. So it's uh, extra than high flux and in the category of the super flux with the using of both. And they have a classification for dialysis, not like in Europe. They are not classifying low or high. They are classifying dialyzer into five classes from class one to class five, depending on the beta two microglobulin removal and the protein uh, permeability. Now we are moving to a uh, very well known star in dialysis. Uh, he is uh, known in the practice, he's starting dialysis from scratch, from beginning of uh, machine learning as well from the water treatment station. I think if he is raising his hands, we can find the fingerprint over more than 35 years on the dialysis. Professor Dr. Uh, Tare Tantawi, your, uh, now your voice would be very pleasant to ask. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mr. President, uh, Professor Hisham, uh, my dear brother, Professor uh, Magdi Sherkawi, really a very, a very, a very nice uh, night. I am enjoyed a lot. I am, uh, had a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, new information uh, this night. 
uh, we cover a lot of issues around the dialysis, uh, not only uh, about uh, uh, nutrition, uh, adequacy, uh, management of anemia, management of CKD, MBD, uh, actually cover all, a lot of things. Uh, as you mentioned there, Professor Hisham, uh, uh, a lot of advances, uh, we, we feel it during our journey, during uh, uh, dialysis surface since uh, more than 30 years, with a lot of advances as regard to water, as regard to machine, as regard revolutions in the membrane, as you teach us before and as you educate us before. Uh, actually, the patient, the, the pattern and the shape of our patient improved a lot. Uh, in spite of that, there is still our patient not satisfied. Uh, actually, we cover, yeah, we manage uh, uh, a lot of things properly, and uh, our knowledge increased, and and we know a lot of things that before uh, was not clear to us, uh, and actually we go more than depth than before, and as part of that, our patient is still not satisfied. I think there is a psychiatric issue we have to target in our management, and we have to rule out depression. And we have to, uh, to, to change a, a lot of lifestyles in their patient because we improve a lot of things. As you mentioned, as Professor Magdi mentioned, patient before, uh, the only what we have, the blood transfusion for management of anemia. We haven't uh, a lot of phosphorus binder. Uh, uh, we have only aluminum based uh, uh, phosphorus binder before. Uh, we haven't uh, resorbiotin, a lot of things has improved. And the actual the shape of our patient in the waiting room, we notice it very well because uh, before uh, uh, our patient like gasping, like dying, when they are waiting for dialysis, a lot of things improved. A lot of issue uh, has clarified. I'm enjoyed uh, very well and I have nothing to add uh, except that we have to target the, the issue of satisfaction Maybe need kind words. Maybe need some uh, uh, antidepressant. Maybe need some encouragement. Maybe need uh, to, uh, to to look for the social, for uh, for financial support for this uh, patient because a lot of them lost work, uh, uh, lost interest in life. So uh, actually correct a lot of things: uh, anemia, CKD, MBD, uh, calcium, phosphorus, beta H, nutrition. Uh, I think we. Uh, uh, we cover a lot of this issue uh, that uh, our patient has the proper diet, uh, uh, including uh, good protein amount, uh, uh, how to drink, how uh, many issues like salt and 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 it's it's really I'm enjoying and uh, many thanks for your uh, uh, effort today to enrich our knowledge. Uh, not 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 only juniors but also seniors are satisfied and. Send many thanks for your uh, effort today. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor uh, Dr. Tariq. I think the revolution of home dialysis will give a lot of the uh, very support for the patients because feasible uh, on site of dialysis, frequent Agreed. dialysis, and this may improve the quality of life and depression. Uh, at the end of uh, our last few minutes, because we have, a, we have a democracy. Professor Hisham, yes. I think we have yeah. an important question in the chat. Uh, last question, please. If the patient developed MI during hemodialysis after emergency treatment, when I will start his sessions? It depends on the uh, additional information. If the patient, for example, has a pulmonary edema, you can use a slit technique. If the patient has a cardiac problem and uh, shock, you can go to peritoneal dialysis or uh, CRRT, or you can wait till the uh, cardiac enzymes have been returned to normal or angiography emergency and geography it depends on situation there is no clear cut about that because all of them is a life threatening myocardial infarction is a life threatening pulmonary edema or hyperkalemia is also a, a, a life threatening so you can compensate between waiting or the risk of dialysis and i prefer to go with slower smooth dialysis than the regular intermittent dialysis uh, lastly, lastly uh, we, because we enjoy the democracy, we can keep uh, an, one of the audience if he's raised his hand to give his comment. So uh, if one of the audience 
needs to have a comment, he can uh, open his camera and uh, can unmute himself and give his words before closing. So I give you the chance of democracy uh, and I, I, I keep you updated on the next session. Thank you again, Professor uh, Dr. Magdi, Professor Pa, pa uh, Professor Faisal, Professor Saeed, Professor Ayman, Professor Yasser, and uh, finally, one to close is Professor uh, Yasser Abu Talib. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for, very, uh, for this highly rich uh, in uh, lectures and discussions, which we enjoyed all. Thank you really, professors. And uh, excuse me to close this meeting. Hopefully to meet you much. next week, inshallah. Uh, just uh, tell you that our next lecture will be not on Wednesday as usual. Uh, Professor Amr al-Husseini lecture will be on uh, Tuesday. This week only we will uh, shift our schedule for some uh, conditions of life So we will meet you, I hope to meet you inshallah next Tuesday. Inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank and you, Professor Yasser, Abdel Hamid, and thank you to all. Please enjoy your night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Good you. night. Thank you. Thank you. Yasser, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.